Okay, you guys, welcome back to the Bishy PE podcast. Uh, I think we're on episode three now, um, and we're joined today by Stuart Yule. Um, Stuart is a strength and conditioning coach with the Scottish International Rugby side. Good morning, Stuart. Good morning, Grant. It's actually afternoon, actually. <laughs> 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 All that Sunday. I was just, I was just, pl- I was just playing along. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're also joined again by Mr McHugh. Hello, Mr McHugh. Hello there, how are you doing? Hello there. More neutral colour this week, looking good and great. Yes, so I've, I've had a shave, I've had a bit of the sun, so I'm, I'm looking a wee bit fresh. <laughs> Excellent, and hello to Mr Johnson. Good morning guys. Good stuff. Um, so we'll kick off today, um, thanks for joining us Stuart. Uh, if you would just mind um, telling us a wee bit about yourself, where you're from, etc. Yeah, no problem. Um, well, I've been a bit all over, really. I was born in South Africa um, a long time ago now, and all my family's from Scotland, so we moved very young age back to Scotland. Um, we are in Scotland for just six years, and Dad's job moved us down to south of England. So I was at school in, in Newbury in the south of England from six until 18, and then when I was 18, came back up to Scotland for university, and I've, I've been back up here ever since. Yeah, superb. Um, do you kind of touched it about your school career, but can you tell me a bit more detail? Um, did you leave in what would be our fourth and fifth year, or did you stay on um, kind of until you're 17, 18? Yeah, no, I stayed on. I mean, it, it, obviously, it's slightly different in England with um, you know, um, GCSEs and A levels, but I stayed on for my A levels, which I left school at 18. So. Um, one school until I was, um, which GCSEs, the equi- equivalent of Nat Fives, um, and then I went to another school to finish my to do my A levels, which was over two years. Um, yeah. So yeah, so it was it, just with kind of family and everything else, and, and probably a lot of people just did, did that at the school I was at. So um, yeah, it was a natural course to take. Yeah. Um... What was your favourite subject in school and was there anybody potentially at school that was a kind of influential teacher or an influential role model for you throughout your school career? Um, it's not really a stage question, but PE was, um, I would say, yeah. my favourite subject. Um, yeah. My dad was an engineer and he said he could uh, help me out with my maths and I was tend to be good. It just it came quite easy to me. So maths just, you know, it's not easy for everybody, but that for me was a subject I could just do and go yeah. like that. Um, but in terms of enjoyment and getting stuck in, it was PE. And I think in terms of the PE teachers I had at the time, that, that made it as well. They, you know, this would have been back in um, you know, the 80s and uh, late 80s and um, early 90s. And um, obviously I've been away from school a long time, so I'm not sure how, how school sports are in PE, but, you know, it was fortunate a range of sports, football, rugby, athletics, cricket, um, basketball. So we had a, a whole load of sports that we did. The P teachers were great. You know, they kind of, you know, they, they made it made it fun to, to be part of. We had school teams as well and, and, yeah. and sports. So, um, so yeah, so that, that, that was a big part of, of my upbringing and was, yeah. was sports. Um, say my parents both went to the Commonwealth Games for what? Um, for mum was athletics and dad for weightlifting. So sport was kind of yeah. in the family. Um, so I've got a twin brother. So just being the same age, we're very competitive. And um, if there was an argument, it'd be boxing gloves in the back garden. Uh, so, so it's, yeah, so it was a sport at school and PE at school was almost an extension of, of what life was a little bit about away from school as well. Yeah. Did you, did you find that there was a, a little bit of added pressure because your parents were obviously involved with athletics and, and weightlifting that you had to be at the forefront? Um, not necessarily pressure. I think it, it because it was what we did and it was just the way we were brought up. Um, I think having a twin brother probably added the pressure because if he's doing well, I've got to do well. Um, you know, and it becomes competitive. And so, but I think, you know, that. It, it was healthy, you know, this, if, if we progress at anything, there's got to be a little bit of challenge and yeah, so pushed. And, um, and I think it just made it, it made it enjoyable. You know, you're not, not bored. There's 
you know, we went to athletic club, went to the rugby club. Um, you know, there's just the table tennis club. It was say mum and dad's um, played squash on a Saturday, and me and my brother went along and played. I remember once I beat him and running down the corner afterwards with him chasing me with a racket because I beat him. But it's you know, it was just it was just part of what we did, so it was normal for us, I suppose. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. Just when, when you're talking there about your extracurricular activities, what was there anything in particular that you kind of focused on at school, um, and was there any particular skills that you felt were relevant for the kind of working world? Um, school such a long way away. It's racking, racking my brain a bit. Yeah. I think for me it was everything. It was, you know, the academic side, and, and I say I go back to maths, and um, you know, it's not everyone's favourite, but. It, taught me a little bit about you've got to go through the processes, go through the stages, be patient. You know, it's not yeah. about the answer, you know, let, let's get the answer. No, let's get the stages right. If we get that right. So maths kind of, it's kind of laid a, a foundation from just working things out and problem solving. Um, and then say the sports side was, was awesome from just having fun with your, with your friends and, and being healthy and, and, and as well, it's a chance, depending on how far you get. But for me, so I, I went on to to do weightlifting. I went to a couple of Commonwealth Games and, and just that journey of you get to travel, or travel, see different places. Um, you know, opens up a lot of opportunities to meet lots of sort of different people and have great experiences. Um, yeah. so, so school kind of, for me, it was, it was the enjoyable things, which you, you tended to do a lot of, but then all the other bits help just to build a platform to then be able to do the things you want to do. So that's safe where I am now that all every, every aspect, every, you know, sciences, maths, um, English, you know, big thing now with, you know, in, in terms of as I've evolved in my career, it's about communication and the relationships with people. Um, and, you know, that's not, you don't study that in, in books. That's, you know, form relationships is, cool. is working with yeah. people and, yeah. And getting on with people. Yeah. Okay, sure. So the next question is for me. Um, could you tell me just a wee bit about your journey into um, strength and conditioning? Mm -hmm. Well, as I say, I mean, I was very fortunate with just my upbringing, sport-wise, um, yeah. and then, and also fortunate with the time of me get, getting into strength and conditioning. Now, within professional sports across football, rugby, there's institutes of sport. Um, you know, you look at how successful Great Britain are at Olympic Games, but they've all got strength and conditioning support. So now it's a, it's a massive um, part of athletes' lives is, is having that as a formal part of what they do. And but when I started, it was pretty very early in its, in, as a career. Mm -hmm. Footballer, football teams might have had a fitness coach, which was maybe, which was maybe the physio as well. Um, and say a lot of, athletes would have their coach would be their strength and conditioning coach as well so so when i started it was um the scottish institute of sport was in its infancy as well and say so strength and conditioning as a career was very much in, in its infancy so because of my background in weightlifting which is a you know one component of of preparation and technically having good knowledge i was you know brought in very early just around that side of things um but I didn't, and I wasn't initially a, a strength and conditioning coach. I say I went to university, actually say, you know, if you're talking about maths, I did maths first time around at Edinburgh Uni and I finished after three years and then I had a year out and then I it wasn't, you know, for me, an area that I wanted to necessarily go further on. And I then went back and did a, a degree in physiotherapy. So I went to Queen Margaret University College in Edinburgh and did physiotherapy because for me, it's a vocation. It's whether you work in sport or not, it's got a lot of value. Um, it's exercise based. It's it's you know it's not necessarily a lot of physios will treat, but you know the real difference you can make with people is through exercise. And so I did four years at uni, then graduated, and and then I got a job pretty much straight away at uh, Falkirk Football Club with um, John Hughes, and he was the manager at the time. And you know, most people went to the NHS, but I was you know the opportunity came up, and I I took it. Um, yeah. I did a year there, which was great, and you know, enjoyed my time there. But an opportunity came up with the Scottish Institute of Sport on strength and conditioning. And I thought if I was, as a, I thought maybe ten years down the line as a physio, if the opportunity came up, I'll probably would have gone for it. So I thought let's go for it now. 
yeah. again, fortunate enough to get it in the Scottish Institute as um, you know, the lead strength ignition coach for the west of Scotland as a region and led on badminton and judo as nationals in Scotland and a lot of multi-sport, a lot of athletics, swimming. Um, we had football came in at that point as well. They got some support from the Scottish Institute at the time, hockey. So that opportunity came up then. Um, and so that, 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 that was the start of my career really in, in strength and conditioning and moved to the English Institute of Sport, worked with the, the British judo team up to the Beijing Olympics. Um, and then a short period with GB hockey, worked with some track and field, and then came up to, um, that, say, that was down in England in that last bit of my career. And then I came up to Scotland, back up to Scotland in 2009 to work with Glasgow yeah. Warriors. Um, and was with Glasgow Warriors for eight years before transitioning into the, the national team. So it's, I'd say the, the, the journey for me has been, been excellent. Um, and, you know, there's ups and downs, but you know, if it was, if I'd look back, you know, when I was a kid and said, "What would you want to do?" I'm kind of doing it, which is, uh, you know, is a pretty privileged position to be in. Yeah. You were just mentioning there, just obviously you've got huge experience there, and you've worked with a variety of different athletes from different sports. This is just a kind of personal question from me, but if you get which which kind of sport would you say creates or ha has Kind of best all-round athletes. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, my son's fourteen and loves his rugby and has got massively into basketball recently. And um, yeah. you know, we have discussions about who's the best athletes. And you obviously the, the, saw the last dance on Netflix. With, that, that's actually uh, the reason I brought it up. Yeah, because I've yeah, been watching that. Um, you know, there's there's phenomenal athletes. I think it's the same when it comes to strength and conditioning will define what being strong is or what being fit is it's specific to the sport you know sports are so unique in their demands it gets to that level that you know you take a, a the best bastard michael jordan and put him on the rugby pitch he wouldn't last but you take the best rugby player put him on the basketball court he wouldn't last it so you take them out of their environment and you put them in another one they look like amateurs so and so yeah so it's, it's difficult i think you know each of the you know any elite sport, you know, it's foot, the best footballers in the world, best rugby players, best basketballers. They're, they're all tremendous athletes. And if they started younger in that sport, they'd have probably made it in another sport as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a great question. And it's, I think it's, that, that's one thing that working in all the sports has taught me, though, is that, is that they are so unique and you, and you have to really master the sport to, to excel. And then the physical bit, you know, comes underneath it to, to to allow you to do it to that level. Um, yeah. Okay, so my next question then um, is about your school and university. So, or, or your time at school and university. Did you have any part time jobs, either at school or university? And then a kind of side question to that: Do you think again these help develop some skills which have helped you to be successful in, in your current yeah. career? Um, when I was at school, I just did a paper round. Um, you know, it was delivering, there was the free paper, so it was, you know, get around it as quick as you can. And Did you get some good touch, Jack? No, well, it was free, so I didn't get anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got a couple of quid for, um, for it, but, um, you know, I wasn't astute enough to actually go to the one to get whatever the, the ones people pay for. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that, that was it during, um, during my school years, um, so it was, you know, we're away every weekend doing sports and just everything like that. So it didn't lend itself too much time to, to have a part-time job. And then prior to going to university, I worked um, through the summer just in, in Sainsbury's to get some cash for, for uni. Um, and then when I was at uni, and I'd work every summer, some some job. It was a, you know, selling dish towels rounds, industrial estates one summer and packing telephones one summer. Um, and then... Um, during uni, I worked at the Edinburgh University Sports Centre just as a just as an attendant. Just again, it was where I was training. Um, my flat was right next door. You know, again, just that kind of environment was was good to be in. So yeah, so to kind of just do stuff just to keep, get some money and um, and I think it in terms of the value, I think it's extremely valuable that you. you know, Athletes now probably when they're 
going to go straight from when some of the guys we work with have gone straight from school into an academy into a professional environment where all they've done is their sport and yeah. um, you know I think it's important to to earn the you know to realize the value of of money and have, what you have to do to kind of earn it so um so yeah I'd, I'd you know I said my kids when they're kind of older will be encouraging them to not just expect things to be given and yeah um, yeah so it's crucial I think it's it's, it's that's the way the way we live. We have to we have to, to work hard and, and, and earn some earn value through through what we do. Definitely. Yep. Is that me now, I? Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting a good question. Um, obviously, last week we spoke to Graham Jones, who worked at the, the SFA, um, who was in the high performance. So pretty much a very similar role. The very first question I asked him was, "What was what was sports science? But what is strength and conditioning? Is it exactly yeah. what the term says?" Yeah. Now again, great question. The, 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 I suppose the the title strength and conditioning has come from America. You know, they've had strength and conditioning within NFL teams, basketball teams, college teams. So, and it is, as you say, John, it's strength training and it's the conditioning that, that goes with it. So we could call it anything. You know, fitness tr- fitness coach physical preparation, a lot of people call it athletic preparation, athletic performance. So basically it's it's the it's all the things, all the physical part that underpin the sport that, that you're playing. So um, so for rugby, for example, we've got a prop forward that's that's big and strong and has to push things, big heavy things. You've got your backs that have to be quick and run around. So they've got speed to work on speed. So it's it's taking the performance, the technical performance. And then breaking it down into what are the components of the physical that make that up, and then it's you know my role will be to work on those components. So I do very much see my role though as being how they perform on the pitch. So my job doesn't end. Oh, I've got them quicker, or I've got them better, yeah. or I've got them stronger. It's got to transfer. So so it's it's very much engaging in 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 the whole process. So it's the physical performance on the pitch that matters to me now. Now that that means that you know some a lot of the physical parts are developed by the coaches and how we train. So if we train, if we get really quick, you know, just in speed training, but we train really slowly, we're not going to play quick. So or have have high tempo in a game. If you know if, if we get a proper forward really strong, but they never do any scrummaging, and they they're going to lose a, lose the scrum. So. So it's the same in all sports, you know, again, working in judo, you can get them as strong as you like, but they don't have the technique to transfer it and that ability and that feel on the mat, then it's, it, it doesn't matter. So, so yeah, so it's, it's the underpinning components. It's, for me, the way I look at it sometimes, it's, it's giving them the potential to perform. It's not going to define how well they perform. There's yeah. just so many other layers that, that kind of mesh together to, to produce a performance on a given day. Can we just say, Stuart, that the... The kind of training programs that you would create for athletes is very tailored to them. Then, because I watched, I think I watched a video that you were in, and it was a, a front row player, and he was lifting weights with yeah. his neck, probably weights that I couldn't lift my full body. Yeah, I just didn't know if that was there's something very specific to him in his position. Yeah, no, there is definitely You're absolutely right. There's, um, yeah, I mean, it's say every position's got a, a demand. So even the, even then, individuals you can break it down to the position as a demand. Yeah. Sport has a demand, the position has a demand, um, and then that individual has got their own individual requirements, as in, you know, for, you take the simple example of the of a forward who has to be strong, but he, he might he might already be really strong, and that's not going to add to his performance, but he needs to improve on his speed or his power, so he needs more, more of a power, power focus, or he might not be able to repeat those efforts, he needs to work more on his is repeat um, effort, ability, is conditioning side of things. So, so it's very much tailored to to the individual. Um, otherwise, yeah, and, and it's got to work for them. Come the come game day of the competition. See, in terms of the organisation of that, I mean, like I think I speak behalf of Scott and Grant here, but having thirty kids and trying to plan for them is hard enough. But if you've got thirty athletes in front of you. And all 30 have got a, a personalised programme. One person's working on this, one person's working How do you manage that? How do you, yeah. you organise that within that setting? Yeah, it's a great question in terms of, you know, it, 
it's difficult. And I'd say that when it comes to the reality of what that looks like, some people will be on the same program. And so you'd have, it'd be more that planning stage of, right, this is our team. This is, we've got five players who are lacking a bit of conditioning, five players are lacking strength. These guys need to work on speed, right? There's a program. And then within it, you know, went back to some stuff I said at the start about relationships. You've got a relationship, you know, people talk about coach-athlete relationships and having a relationship that the, the player has that input into, I, I need to work a bit more on this. And that helps manage a group of players that it's not just me telling you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do that. They've, you know, one of the things that I've tried to do in the part of the teams of I've worked with, I've, I've worked hard, the coaches have worked hard, is, is just that ownership. So if if a player is going to make progress, they have to have ownership of their program. If, if they continually get told what to do all the time, they're not really going to re- reach their potential. They have to understand what they're doing. They, ha- they have to think about what, what they need. So that's an integral part to, to managing that. It's, it, otherwise, it would be impossible just to write 30 different programs. I'd, I, if I'm writing a training program, you know, sitting here in my house on any given day, that could be redundant as well because of how that athlete has woken up that morning or how they feel. They may feel I'm really sore. So we have to modify continually, um, you know, even beyond the individualization of a, of a program. And, and for, that, so for that to be effective, it's, that athlete has to be really engaged with it, which, which is what part of I suppose the, the environments and the cultures we try and create um, yeah. where we are. Obviously you, you touched on it there about ownership and in terms of the quality, but is there any other qualities that, that certain players have in order to become a professional rugby player? Land, obviously, the yeah. Or- yeah, um it, it, in many ways the word sounds simple but it's hard work is underpins all of it again if you're watching the last dance, the amount of work that someone like Michael Jordan put into getting to be the best, it's it's 24 hours. We we see them for, you know, you know if we're full-time in you know, Glasgow or with Scotland, it was from camp, we're, we're afternoon training. So we got a lot of contact time, but the actual training time is maybe, you know, three hours total within a day. You know, we've got another 21 hours, which is, is theirs to to manage and, and that's still, it's not hard work in a, in a, in an effort, in a physical effort perspective, it's making sure their food's right, it's making sure they do their recovery, uh, making sure they get enough sleep so that the next day they can, they can take those steps forward. So hard work underpins it. Um, and on top of that's consistency. So it's, it's not just doing it once, it's doing it week on week on week on week. Um, so, so those two things for me are, are could have probably either been developed when you know some of the top players are young in terms of how they've brought up, and then it's it's almost harnessed, if you like, by their drive to want to get better and and to win, and um, so it does become a daily regime, if you like, of of, of getting on with things. And, and and saying that, you know, it's, it's for them, it's it's. It's what they want to do, so so they work hard at it. To, to yeah. Get it. You know, like you obviously you spent eight years with Bad Warriors, is that right? Yeah. Well, I would imagine that was a sort of day to day basis. That's correct. Yeah. So that was yeah, full time. Um, so she obviously now that you've moved to the, the, the international setup, is it a bit yeah. more challenging then going from that day to day seeing the guys? on a day-to-day basis then maybe only seen them maybe not the yeah. Northern Test or the Six Nations or the World Cup yeah yeah, yeah no it's, it's a completely different role I mean I, it's, it's more of a you know it's a, a management role if you like in terms of just managing looking at data going to the two pro teams spending time with them understanding what they're working at on so there's there's and then I'm an S&C coach when it comes to those to those peers and the biggest difference as well is we only get them for short periods of time. So we get them coming into, which is a pretty um, heavy competition period with one week before the six nations. So we're not going to be training massively. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to be introducing, you know, a fitness regime or anything that's going to take them away from performing on, 
on a Saturday. So, so it's a, it's a very different role. Um, so yeah. And then obviously the Warriors, it's, it's, it's day to day. You're, you, you might not, as you're in seasons, most of the year, you don't want to add new things to them, but you can plan ahead a lot longer. You can say, right, let's rip feed this, you know, a little bit of speed work in that you know, in eight weeks time, we'll start to see the benefit. Whereas we don't have that, that luxury internationally, but the fortunate thing is in Scotland, there is only two pro teams. So, and we, and most, most of the players that play for Scotland that are at those teams, two excellent strength conditioning coaches there. They've got great setups at both teams. Um, and, and so that, my position is, is very fortunate and so they do a great job with them. So my question out to myself is, are they prepared for international rugby? And so I'll look at a lot of the monitoring data, liaise with, with the two teams, um, and by and large, they're, they're doing an excellent job there. That, that means that we get players in, in great condition when they come to us. Just, this is a personal question. I feel as if I'm at the one of the questions here, sorry. Um, in terms of what you're planning, how much do you need to um, liaise with, with, with Gregor Townsend? Because does he come to you and say, right, I need this, or do you go to him and say, this is what we're doing? Yeah. Yeah. No. Is yeah, I mean, ultimately, Gregor has been head coach. He will set how he wants us to play, what his tactical model is of how we're going to win games um, and the fact I've worked with him at Glasgow as well we an excellent relationship in terms of I know what he wants without his necessarily having to meet to discuss it now um, but he, he will set that over you know overview of, of what he, because now internationally much, much of the all well you know 90% of the work 95% of the work is about the rugby. It's, it's guys coming into a new environment to learn new plays for an upcoming game, um, you know, get the cohesion to, 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 to work together. So so it's very much my, my kind of role is almost that planning of the week to maximise it physically. So let's have a heavy day, light day, heavy loading. And that, say that's, so it's led by Gregor from our, this is how we want to play. And then I'll then, you know, have, have that element of planning around well, what can it look like for for us to deliver it, um, but back at a club level, it's it's pretty much the same. There's a winning template as to right, what's going to win a rugby game. So it's outstanding defence, for example. So then I'll be underneath that. How physically do we need to support that? We need to have a capacity to to defend for you know for for four minutes if need be. Um, we need to you know, to have a dominant tackle. We need to have excellent lower body power. So what does our week look like to develop these things? Um, we need to taper off obviously to into a game so you know wh- how much loading should we have on each day that means that we're we're going to be prepared on, on the weekend and then feed that back to Gregor as well so if there's a, you know if there's, a, if there's a particular day we need you know, it's a crucial training day but someone's you know done massive amount of you know from GPS a load of running they've had loads of contacts the communication there is like you know he's had a big week he might not have the capacity to have, have a, an excellent session or it's you know, well, let's cut, pull them out for ten minutes. The last ten minutes doesn't need to do that that bit. So there's, so there's, you know, that that communication is happening happening daily. So um, yeah, but it's it's be, it's, be, it's my philosophy in strength and listening as well. I think initially strength and listening, you know, as I said way back when it first became a, a career, and you had strength and listening coaches had sports science degrees, and you know had all had all the knowledge. Almost that led the process. Um, whereas it. It can't lead the process. The sport has to lead the process. What are you trying to achieve on the pitch? And uh, within the football world, is um, Mourinho has kind of popularised a, a tactical periodization, which is the, how the physical is done within a tactical situation. So if we want to have speed, it's not a speed training session away. It's how can we integrate that within football? So the so the, so it, it, that so that's football leading how. How you need to train, um, rather than being the, you know, what do we need physically? I've just got one last week question. Um, what would you say is that the best part about working within the, the strength and conditioning sector of the industry itself? Um, I mean, the best part is I still don't see it as a job. <laughs> so um, yeah. you know, I'm, you know, you're kind of working with with 
the best, say from my perspective now, the best rugby players in Scotland and potentially the best, some of the best rugby players Scotland has ever had, which, as I say, is a privilege to to be able to do that and to help them reach their goals. So that's, I say, kind of headlines it, and you know, it's yeah, it's just an environment which is is always about getting better. It's varied, you know. To say my career has allowed me to work with different sports, different athletes. Um, it's given me a great insight into just what performance is about when it comes to it. You know, it's working with, say, track and field athletes when it comes to speed. Like, I understand what speed is actually about when people talk about what being powerful or quick is, what the judo players, you know, ways to Japan with them and seeing the best judo players in Japan and how they, you know, went again been into their situation, what, how do they develop their judo players? Um, you know, say now in, now in rugby, it's, you've got an athletes, certainly that's where I really enjoy rugby. It's, it's, it is so varied. You've not just got, you know, seeing football and, and out in Australia, you've got AFL, they're, they're running, the physical bit is running, the skill and the sport, you know, is, is determines how good they are, but the physical bit underneath of it is, is mainly running, whereas in rugby, it's running, it's contact, it's, it's you know, in a tackle, there's like a wrestle, it's, it's so it's really varied and, and um, that, that kind of keeps, keeps me engaged. Yeah. Superb. Um, you, you mentioned there, Stuart, about how you, you've been involved with hockey and judo, uh, kind of rugby and football as well. Would you, would you say there's a massive difference in terms of see the strength and conditioning kind of training uh, for, for the athletes in, in those sports? Yeah, the, the, there's differences in terms of how much time you would spend on activity or how much importance you would put on developing a, a quality, a physical quality. Yeah. So... For example, you know, training for just getting muscle mass, for example, for, for hockey isn't going to necessarily help them. It might hinder them because they'll get heavier and become yeah. less efficient. Um, football, you know, the same. Whereas for a, a, a rugby player, it might, might be what they need to do. Um, yeah. But, it, you know, in terms of we take it back to, you know, layers again, if I see a strength conditioning, it is the foundation. So if we want to be quick, in order to be quick, we need a good strength to weight ratio but to develop that we need to get stronger um so strength plays a part so so very much the pillars strength speed power um anaerobic or aerobic conditioning are are all there within each of those sports but it's it's how important they part they play within it um and then the other difference is just what we're preparing for so for example judo We'll go through peers, we'll have maybe a competition, but it won't be every single weekend. Yeah. Um, whereas obviously rugby, football, you've got games week in, week out for, for a long part. So it's how we're how we're conditioning athletes there. Um yeah. you know, in the field, it's you know, through the summer there's there's some events where they've got long winter peers where they can prepare. So so yeah, so it's it's, it's similar. So you might you know, someone stronger you need to do some strength training on and that way that you strength train a hockey player yeah is going to be similar to how you'd strength train a rugby player but how much time you spend on it and what other exercises you might do will, will vary yeah superb just just a wee personal question from me Stuart, if you don't mind um has there been any 5k challenges happening with any of the national sites <laughs> um, we've, um, had a wee, we've had a wee 5k challenge in the department um, right. you'll probably see mr McHugh hasn't Mentioned that yet? Um, <laughs> see the he came last, but it'd be interesting. Oh, to see it, sure. he, just, he just outright denies it. Even so, 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 what times? What, what times are we talking about here? For so, Mister Johnson uh, came in with an eighteen thirty-seven. Oh, that's um, pretty good, eh? Me, uh, I was eighteen fifty-five. I think Mister Johnson and Mister yeah. McHugh. I was an official. I was an official. Yeah, two maybe. Official nineteen twenty-five. <laughs> Uh, well, I would say I would, I would say they're all out of any sort of league that, that we'd have a 5k there's a um, there's a few people on Strava just now and um, some of the staff and management our physio is who's quick but he's he's probably a, a 20 minute um, he went for it um, yeah. Super. we've got a few players are out there kind of get running the streets just obviously at the moment with with not being able to do much but I'd say yeah. those scores are 
are probably going to be well ahead of, of some of the, the guys that we've got doing it. I'd probably say, to be fair to the, the youngs, I think it's very flat, isn't it? And it's some of it's probably downhill, so that probably helps as well. Yeah. Wind behind us, Chuck. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, 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 that's the best way to do it, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I used to, was used to we had an anti-gravity treadmill at, at Glasgow and so when I um, used to go on it just for you know do a bit of running and it was superb taking my body weight down to about 60 kilos and um, and running you know it was it felt yeah. felt beautiful just being able to run at, run at that weight but we got some guys who are pounding the street 120 kilos body weight which I'm yeah. not sure um, you know hopefully we, we get back to some training soon because it's it's not necessarily the best for the big boys to be doing that. No. Hey, can I ask a question, Stuart, just about what, what you would say the kind of, or one particular highlight of your professional career has been so far, if you were to choose one? Apart from doing this podcast, obviously. Uh, well, <laughs> after this podcast. Well, that's, up, that's up there. Um, difficult to choose one. I think... You know, the, the time I had at Glasgow was great and we won the, the Pro 12 at the time. It's called Pro 14 now. Yeah. And that Pro 12 because we, at the time we'd been in the playoffs, so it was fourth, it was, we were third. We got to the final year before where we lost the final, so we were second and we were first. So it was a real journey and the players at the time, um, you know, it was Cal- Al Kellogg was a captain. Is Al Kellogg an ex Bishop Briggs? Yes, yeah. yeah. So, I, I think we should actually can we can we call Al Kellogg out at this point and maybe find out <laughs> Yeah, I'm on. Um but he, so he was captain and was instrumental in just driving the whole culture. Greg started as, as head coach there and so that I think in terms of uh you know, when something you've worked hard at something over an extended period of time. For it to come, you know, in terms of achieving the goal is is always a is a big thing. So I'd, I'd say that is um it was my first number one highlight. Um, you know, I'd say that you asked for one, but you know, being in England at at Murrayfield a couple of yeah. years ago was, oh, yeah. was um, superb. But um, yeah, I'd say say that the Glasgow War is one putting the, the trophy. So we spoke, spoke about kind of highlights there, um, and I think it's a really important message for the people that everybody, no matter how successful they are, are going to experience some setbacks. So would you say that you've had any kind of setbacks within your career, and then maybe as an add-on to that, did they help shape you, and did, did you maybe learn from those? Yeah, I mean, I say my whole my whole look. I, I tend to see the the, the glass half full rather than empty, and um, Say my view on setbacks, and and also my I suppose my personal standards are that I probably have them every day. You know, I'm not satisfied with that, and we need to do better at that. And um, so I've not I've not had I've not you know I've not had setbacks in a hardship way. I've yep. been fortunate with my family upbringing, and say so worked hard and the jobs I've had. So, but from a from daily review of what I do, I look at getting better and say some of the things I saw up to, so I mentioned, you know, working for British Student up to 2008 and it was, it, was a, it was a big learner for me and more around how I approached my job. We had a, a period of time where we could have we planned training as how we thought was going to be best and took the, the, the athletes out of their judo environment, say, like, let's, we had a long time to prepare, let's just do some conditioning and fit as we can, strong as we can, um, and then take them back the mat and when they went back to the mat they just felt they'd lost their feel and their technical side and there was still time to Beijing but it kind of taught me that we don't take athletes out of their environment that they yeah. need you know with a swimmer never stops swimming a you know a runner never stops running um and it's the same then going and taking that into rugby it's you know again previously as I said SNC might have just led processing well, let's just do six weeks of just SNC and we don't touch the rugby ball and this and, and for me it's a big no no like it's and that was that was a big lesson professionally. Like let's whatever the sport is, that has to be a, a main pillar of, of consistency and working on technique and skill. And there's so many aspects to, to performance that if we remove a part of it, then we're gonna we're gonna not be as good as we can if we, we look at how we can keep things keep things integrated. Um, you know, but then little things as well, like if 
if an athlete gets injured in the gym for me, like it might, these things happen, but I look at it critically and I go, what could we have done better? Yeah. You know, yeah. had a couple of instances where, you know, maybe a weights fall on someone's foot. Um, that, that could be, yeah. fortunately it's not happened to, be, to, to an extent of speed in someone's career, but it could be. So let's, have we set up the safety, right? Have we explained to players? Have we inducted them properly? So it's, it's, so all the time, any sort of mistake that I've made or has happened, and whether I deem as, oh, it wasn't my fault, but what could I have done to ensure that you don't allow for mistakes in the future? So it's always been learning, and that's, that's been a big part of sport for me. And there's a lot of, if you speak to psychologists, will say the people that will win learn quicker than the others. So we can learn quicker, and that take that from our a sports performance perspective, but even from just little things, you know, just in and around the day-to-day job of being in the gym or out on the pitch, have we warmed up properly? Um, so it's continually reviewing that detail for me has been has been one thing that I've, I've learned over the years. Yeah. So in terms of um, like match days, obviously we spend the whole week preparing the athlete for the game at the weekend. At what point do you sort of, I don't want to say, like, relax or switch off? Are you, are you still involved on the match day or you find it right and then stop? Yeah, no, um, so match day, say my role match day is to say it's over to the players pretty much in terms of getting it right and so the coaches will have a part in that. I'm involved with um, almost the setup of, I suppose if you one of a better word, the flow, that there's there's no interruptions, there's no distractions from our, it will interfere with a physical perspective. So with the kit man, making sure our changing room is set up properly, making sure with our nutritionist, that our nutrition is, is out, our hydration. Um, you know, we will have some players that will do priming. So I've got, unfortunately, I've got um, other staff. So we've got an assistant S&C coach and a sports scientist. So we've got our GPS um, monitors. Sorry, sorry, I, I've got my dad's birthday present. Right? <laughs> <laughs> <Good boys. laughs> um, yeah, so there's there's a whole heap of different things that that we do on game day, and then it comes to the actual warm up side. So leading the warm up, not leading the warm up from a rugby perspective, but coordinating it from a timing perspective, making sure we're we stick to our times. Um, yeah. And that's that's not high pressure, but it's you so say we only have 14 minutes as a team that we warm up for. The rest of the time it's individual. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that that that's kind of game day side of things. So it's not high pressure from a direct you know, involved with with the players to, to perform, but there's there's responsibilities that we have to make sure happen um, to to make sure they can perform physically. Half time, you know, making sure that. We need a bike in the changing room. So it's making, as I say, the flow. Make sure that we don't have any excuses from a player not being able to perform physically. Um, yeah. If they need if they need something, we've made sure they've got it. Um, and that's planned ahead of time. It's not it's not necessarily reacting to yeah. it on the day, but you know, given something, we should be in a position to react. Okay. I've got another sort of personal question. Apologies about the delivery there, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> but the... The Japan World Cup was, was pretty recent, something that anybody that's maybe watching this uh, today will be aware of. What was that like being involved with um, in terms of things? Yeah. It was great to be involved. I've got a long time to reflect now. There's, it was dis- disappointing from how we performed and what, what you know, the, the outcome of it for us, as a, um, you know, especially for the players. And there's a lot of work went into it and you know, felt that well, we, it wasn't what we wanted to achieve from our performance perspective. Um, you know, but it's like anything, there are positives in terms of we are better now and we've learned from that. And there's things that we've done putting in place now. So all the time we're looking at, at how we have how we re- review that. So so there are big positives from that. But from an experience perspective, superb. I mean, Japan was a great place to be. We'd experienced um, you know, a typhoon, an earthquake, um, you know, going on the bullet train from city to city. Um, the Japanese people were, were absolutely phenomenal in, in welcoming and getting things right for us. So, you know, as far as experiences to have, you know, it's, it's another one which 
you know, you, I can look look at and look look fondly at from from what I was involved with, and and just say the big thing for me is what we can learn from it and what we can take from it to to move forward. Which I think we we did um, in many ways with the Six Nations. See the the Tyson that you you'd mentioned. You think that had I'm not really speaking specifically about the Scotland national team, but you think that had a big impact on players and their preparation for games. <laughs> Yeah, well, it undoubtedly would have. I mean, I think it wasn't how we prepared. We normally the day before we do a team run on on the pitch um, at the stadium. We did it in our in our ballroom in the hotel just the room, and um, so so that's not normal. Um, so so yeah, it, it would it was different. You know, every say other teams would have been the same. So you know, there was no competitive advantage for anyone. It was there, so. It was definitely different, but I think that's the thing with sport now. It's um, a high-performance sport. It's the ability to deal with yeah. situations, and um, you know, it's, it's a quote that I can't remember the exact quote, but Darwin talks about evolution, and you know, it's not the strongest or the most intelligent that survive. It's the ones that can adapt, and survive. So, if we look at look at that as a as something, then who can adapt best to these situations and and still still perform and you know, again going back to the last dance and Jordan it's pretty evident there that um, you know they talk about being present and you know what's behind you has been so there, yeah there was a typhoon yesterday but we're here now and we're here today and we've got a job to do today and that that's that shouldn't affect you there's you know there's a lot of stuff as well around from a physical side you know what what determines fatigue and what did you know someone's maybe going out for a run and this might relate to you guys 5k but you know the central governor theory and you know what actually slows you down it's not it's not your muscle fatigue it's it's what your brain's telling you um so so again that, a lot of, listen to me too that, <laughs> i would slow you down then oh, <laughs> i must have had a late night the night before <laughs> so these, these are all things which you know i think we, we need to look at if when we come to a game day did we perform or not and it was because of something well you know, our, our mind's very powerful, so I think we, we're always able to do what we think we maybe can't do, but if we put our, put our mind to it, it shouldn't matter if there was a type, you know, it's extreme if there was a typhoon the day before, you know, it was there, it's gone now, we can play. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, um, in your current role, Stuart, do you think that's really, like, the pinnacle of your career? Could, could you, where would the avenues be? move on if, if ever that yeah. was yeah. would you be happy staying yeah no definitely happy happy staying I think you know, I'm, I'm you know this is I'm passionate about sport and what sport can do for people um, I'm passionate about Scotland and, and want you know Scotland to be seen as one of the best teams out there um, so I'd I'd want to stay and, and see that journey through and you know however long that is is sometimes not up to me but um yeah you know it's definitely you know and, and also uh, I suppose in our a, a, a bigger picture it's, it's how what that can do to affect other things obviously you guys you know Bishop Briggs and how what we can do to make sure that everyone wants to be healthy everyone wants to play sport everyone wants to you know from a rugby perspective more people want to pick up a rugby ball um so that, that that's that's a kind of a higher aim, you know. My direct roles with the national team and you know the, the my ultimate accountability is how they perform. But um, I think it's important to have a little bit of a higher purpose, if you like, around what, what why 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 really am I doing it? You know, Scotland I'm going to lose rugby games, but for me, it's you know, I want say I've got a fourteen year old and a ten year old. I'd I'd want them and their kids and their kids to be grown up in a country that just loves sport is healthy because they're just engaged in physical activity and they see rugby as one, one of the sports that has almost brought attention to that. It's what I think, for Johnson, you'll back, you'll back up here. We've had a, a similar conversation. Obviously, our sports has, has been football, but I think over, I wouldn't maybe even say the past five to ten years, Maybe the success of the Scottish rugby team has seen yeah. more kids involved with, with, with a rugby setup rather than a football setup. Yeah, I would yeah, say it's probably overshadowed it a wee bit. 
Ah, okay, yeah. for football. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like, yes. you know, this is always like a, a good thing in, in, in terms of for, for rugby because I certainly think that yeah. it has really taken off in the last five ten years because yeah. of the success compared to the, yeah. the not so success yeah. of the, the football side. Yeah, it's an interesting one. It's like what, what comes first, and you know what drives you know popularity, and obviously media and things doing well, and you know, like. Like Scotland now, in terms of world class players like Stuart Hogg, it's brings attention to to a sport. And you know, at Murrayfield, I'm not sure how many games it's been now, but the last certainly since um, I started in 2017 and Gregor started in 2017, I think it's been sold out um, every game. So, so there's there's definite interest, and I think you know, that's testament to. To, to the players that are working hard now and the, the professionals in the sport, but it's, you know, in, in, in other ways, for me, I sometimes hear it's not all about performance and I completely agree it's not about performance, but we've got a responsibility to do that really well in, in my scope of my job now so that it does hopefully influence others, but we also need to work hard at making sure we've got just kids playing sport. My, one of the best experiences I've had was we went to Fiji um, on tour um, and we went to a primary school and every kid so it was playing fields there was however many kids out just playing rugby with a you know and it, it was rugby in a sense of it had a rugby ball but they were kicking it they were but the thing there was no no coaches no cones no rules it just out playing some kids had shoes others didn't and you yeah. just looked at it and just the simplicity of of sport um and, and I think, you know, for me, it's that. We, that's, you know, the money's in professional sport, but that's where we need to put our efforts because that then allows, the, again, fortunate privileged position of guys like me to have, have a job because if people aren't picking that ball up at six, then they're not going to have yeah. anyone to, to work with at this level. So. Am I right in saying that the, I think Fiji, were they world champions at sevens at one point recently? Yeah, they were Olympic, well, they won the Olympics at sevens. Yeah. Um, and then they've, you know, for, for years they've been, you know, they've been one of your number one nations. Um, they're just phenomenal athletes. We had um, Miku Matawalu, who's still at Glasgow, and Leone Nakarao, who's at Glasgow, and two great guys. And, and you can see how, you know, just their environment they've grown up in, just love you just play offloading, you know, with Nico, who plays scrum half and on the wing, so just quick player. But, you know, as SNC coach, we think, oh, we'll teach someone agility, or we couldn't teach Nico agility, he'd be teaching you. It's just from such a young age, just playing. And I think that's that's the importance for me, is, we, you know, we're getting kids, kids doing more of that, then, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be in a better position. Because I think it was actually a video we showed across the department to some of the classes, and it was the Fiji. I think it was kids as well, but also the national team. It was like the sand dunes. They're running yeah, up yeah, sand dunes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, no, yeah, no, they 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 did well at Olympics, and so they've they've got a lot of world class players um, that could um, add value to any team. Finisher, is it? Yeah, I think we're on to the finisher now, Mr. McCute. Finisher, so um, obviously, strength and conditioning coach, if you were to select three athletes from any um, from any sport, past or present, who would it be and why? Three, three athletes for just... If you were to be their strength and conditioning coach. All right. Other than Mr. McHugh, Mr. Johnson, and Mr. Oven, <laughs> <laughs> work on the five K times. Um, yeah, again, it's probably cliche, but I've probably coached them in the sense of you know we've got people out there who would be nice to coach, like a Michael Jordan, but they're so unique. You know, yeah. I talk to Nico Matuidi in terms of agility. It's like, what can I give these guys? They've got you know, they're blessed with um, phenomenal ability and, and um, physical ability. Um, but for me, it's been people I've worked with who have just worked hard and have not just doing what I say, but have thought about it. So in judo, I worked with Ewan Burton. Um, 
who won the Commonwealth Games 2014, is now the Scottish um, national judo coach, someone that's worked hard. Um, and yeah, he's someone that you know, I've, I've enjoyed working with and, and that place like that. Um, you know, in terms of rugby, you know, it's, it's, I don't really want to mention names in terms of you know, but there's players out there that you know, like Pete, Peter Horn, for example, and Chris Fazaro, who 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 work extremely hard. But that list is endless. You've got Johnny Gray, Rob yeah. Harley, just guys that just to just continually want to improve and and work hard. So it's it's difficult to to pick to pick three. If I if I think about other, it's it could be endless. You know, there's you know, within other other sports, I don't know. It's a tricky one. But every everyone I think of though is, is just a tremendous athlete. Without me, you know, I think of <laughs> you know. So it's, I'm not sure. I'd probably make them slower or or or, or add weight, which means they're going to get worse. I wouldn't want to wouldn't, wouldn't want to necessarily go near them. But no, I so say my my passion now is just on people want to get better. I don't care if they're a star or they've whatever if if they fundamentally want to improve yeah. and they show that desire i mean one thing that when i go in my, my kind of approach sometimes is not to give someone a program you know let, let's see what they do let's see how how they think about what they need rather than just straight away like there's a program you know, what, what how are they thinking about what they need and, and they're, the, they're the people i enjoy working with um so that could be you know help coach up at um west of scotland um, well, it's going to be under 15s next year. So my boys under 15 help coach them. You've got some great kids there who want to want to get better. That's that's what I I, I enjoy working with. Um, Brilliant. As much as the you know the, the high profile athlete. That for me, the, the high profile isn't the bit that interests me. It's the it's the bit that do you want to get better and yeah. are you driven to to get better? Yeah. Oh, well. no, thank okay. Is that that was in Gentry? Everybody. Thanks. Yep. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, no I, I just, on behalf of the, the P department, uh, Stuart, thanks very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, great to chat to you guys. Um, yeah, it's been really informative. Um, and a lot of really good information, hopefully, for our pupils. Um, so uh, thank you very much for joining us again. Be sure to follow us at Bishy P and be sure to tune in next week. Uh, we will be posting another podcast. So thanks very much again, guys. Cheers. Uh, sure. thanks, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.